and welcome to St Thomas's. My name's Amara and I'm going to be leading the service today. If you are new, you are very welcome. After church, join us in coffee time. Now Luke's going to lead us in some worship. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we hope you like our singing. Amen.
going to do church news with Joel. Hello and welcome to St Thomas's Church News, the segment that keeps you updated with the life of the church family. In today's news, Nicholas Nelson takes us fishing and Ben Doolan gives us an update on what's happening inside the church. Firstly, over to you, Nick. It's about uh, 9.15. I've been uh, fishing on the river since about 8.40 this morning, so I'm knackered. Uh, just about to drive home to Newcastle. Caught, I think, five fish, and one of them was the biggest brown trout I've ever caught, so it's been a wonderful day. Saw herons and loads of other fish, so I'm going to go home and go to sleep now. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Nick. That is some lovely trout. Now, over to the master, Ben Doolan in St. Thomas's. Well, church, here I am back in St. Thomas's building. The Church of England have just said that one vicar from each church can go back into the church building, so here I am. It's great to be back in here, but we remember that this is not the church. We are the people. But nevertheless, here I am with an exciting update about the building for you. And that is to say that we've appointed a new architect firm to work on our building project with us. They're Doonan Architects, and the architect who's going to be taking a lead on St Thomas's and on the, our building project is a wonderful man called Tristan. He's great, and we're so excited to be working um, in partnership with him. So I'll be in touch in the coming weeks and months about the plans that we're putting together to redevelop St Thomas's, but do be praying for us and for the building project. Back to you, Joel. Thank you very much for that update, Ben. We shall certainly be praying for everything that's going on with the building project. Well, that is all from us at St. Thomas's Church News this week. Remember, if you've got a news story that you'd like to be featured, then let us know. We'd love to get you involved. See you next week. Becca is going to bring us the reading from the book of Matthew. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Today we're looking at God three in one, which we call the Trinity. You'll need some paper or card and some scissors for today's activity, so please feel free to pause the video, go get them and come back to join us. There is one God and the Bible teaches us the three persons of God. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit and God the Son. So with your scissors, cut three strips from your card or paper like this and with them we're going to um, fold them into a braid so if we wrap the first one round and keep it secure you'll get a v and with your third piece um, join that on underneath again wrap it around a couple of times to keep it secure and you'll end up with something like this with two on one side and one on the other if you fold the outer one in so then you have two on one on the other side and one on this side and just carry on adding the outer one into the middle like you would hair, you'll end up with something like this. Each strip represents a person of God, but the braid shows they are woven together into one. Let's pray. Dear God, we know we cannot fully understand how great and wonderful you really are. But we thank you for revealing yourself to us as Father, Son and Holy Spirit, even though you are still one. Help us to learn more about you and the great love you have for each of us. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
Oh, man. Get your pots and pans for the action song led by the Mason family. where we've got some fun things for you and your household to do together. Hey young people, me and Alicia have done another video for you guys, so head over to the St. Thomas Youth YouTube channel to check it out. We'll see you there. My Godfather Ben is now going to speak to us. Thank you Lord for Ben, amen. Hello, if you're watching this and you don't know me, my name is Ben and I'm married to Ellie and together we lead St. Thomas's Newcastle. Now, before we launch into our sermon today, I just wanted to make some reference to the events that have been going on all over the world for the past few weeks to do with racism. The murder of George Floyd has sparked a huge 
debate, discussion about racism pretty much all over the world. And I just want to say this. Last week, we celebrated Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was given on that day to anyone who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. That first Pentecost, there were people from all kinds of different nations, from nations in Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Holy Spirit was given to all of them, to everyone who believed in Jesus. It didn't matter where they were from, their background, their country of origin, their race. And this, of course, is still true today. In fact, in our Bible reading today, Jesus says to the disciples in verse 19, go into all nations. And when Jesus said all nations, he meant all nations and make disciples of them all by baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Through baptism, we are part of one body. This is what the New Testament teaches. When one part rejoices, we all rejoice. When one part of the body hurts, we all rejoice hurt. Now what I'm saying is this, the Bible makes it clear that racism is an abhorrent evil. The Holy Spirit is poured out on all who believe in Jesus. We're called to make disciples of all without distinction. Now church, we can't be silent on this. What made Christianity so radical was it it was the first movement where your country of origin, your race didn't matter. Church, we've got to continue to model this today. The archbishops released a statement earlier this week which said this, God's justice and love for all creation demands that this evil of racism is properly confronted and tackled. Let us be clear, they went on to say, racism is an affront to God. It is born out of ignorance and it must be eradicated. Now, church, we all bear the responsibility for this and must play our part to eliminate racism from society. So let's not be silent. Now, today is Trinity Sunday. In a sense, every Sunday is Trinity Sunday because we worship one God whose name is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Today, churches all over the world, though, are focusing on the doctrine the teaching of the Trinity. And so today we're going to look at three things. Firstly, that the Trinity is truth. Secondly, that this truth about the Trinity is beautiful. And thirdly, that the beauty of the Trinity is life-changing. So firstly, the Trinity is the most fundamental truth in the universe. Now, I am more sure of the reality of the Trinity than I am of anything else. I believe that the fundamental truth that there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the most fundamental truth in the universe. Now, as you know, we are a Church of England church. And what Anglicans believe is outlined in a fantastic document called the 39 Articles of Religion. And the first article, Article 1, is all about the Trinity. And it's the first article because the, what we believe about the Trinity is absolutely fundamental to everything else. And here's what Article 1 says. There is only one living and true God who is eternal and without body, indivisible and invulnerable. He's of infinite power wisdom and goodness. He is the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible. Within the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons who are of one substance, power and eternity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the first article of religion because without the reality of the Trinity, everything else we believe falls apart. You know, what we believe about Jesus' saving work on the cross, about creation, about prayer, about the power and presence of God, it all ceases to make any sense at all if God is not triune. Now, let me illustrate. I suspect if we did a straw poll of what the general population of Newcastle or or the UK or anywhere in the world, if we did a straw poll of what they believed about God, I think that most people, first and foremost, would say that God is love. Everybody wants love to be the central force of the universe. 
Now, as Christians, we really do believe that God is love because that's what the Bible says. But this can only make sense if God really is one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. St. Augustine said this, you cannot say that God is love unless you have a triune God. And why did he say that? Well, let's think about it for a little bit. If you're an atheist, if there is no God, then what we call love is simply just a series of chemical reactions that happen on or in the brain that have helped us to survive and evolve. That's all there is to love. It's just chemical reactions. It's not particularly romantic or pleasing, is it? Now, if you believe in a unipersonal God, that is if you believe in a God who is one, but not three persons in one God, this also presents some huge challenges to the notion of love. A unipersonal God cannot love until he creates, because for love to exist, it has to both be given and received. See, my love for Ellie is love because I love Ellie. She receives that love. She gives it back to me and I receive her love, her love. Now, a unipersonal God could potentially be very powerful, but he could not know love and community. And power without love is a dreadful thing. The God that Christians worship, the God that we know, the one God who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, he has always existed in these amazing relationships of love and community. Forever the Father has loved the Son, who's loved the Spirit, who's loved the Father, who's loved the Spirit, who's loved the Son, who's loved the Father. And that's been going on forever. Love is central to the Trinity. And therefore it makes total sense that God would create a world and people in that world who at the very centre of their being need to know love and community. That's why it's the driving force of the universe. We're made in the image of this God. Now, the triune God is both love and power. So sure, believe that God is love. Even believe that love is the most important thing and the driving force of the universe. But please know this, the only source of that love can be the Trinity. The same is true of grace. You know, grace only makes sense if God has everything that he needs within himself. The triune God doesn't need my worship or my love or my adoration. He's already got everything that he needs within himself, within the processions of the persons of the Trinity. So the very fact that he invites me to worship him is just a sheer act of extending that love and that grace. He invites us to be in relationship with him anyway. He doesn't need it. It is sheer grace. Dr. Tim Keller puts it like this. If the Trinity is the ultimate reality, if this is what the God who made the universe is like, then this truth bristles and explodes with life-shaping, glorious implications for us. If this world was made by a triune God, relationships of love are what life is really all about. The tr Trinity is the most fundamental truth in the universe. Now, secondly, this truth, this truth about the Trinity is truly beautiful. In our Bible reading today, Becca read to us the Great Commission from Matthew's Gospel. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus says this, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, notice that Jesus did not say, go and baptize these disciples in the names of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. It wasn't plural. It was singular. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why did Jesus say this? Because the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are not three separate gods. They are one God. And the name of that one God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Three persons in one God. Now, for those of us that are baptised and following Jesus, we have been baptised into this name. When you were baptised, whoever baptised you said your name, and then I baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that means that we find ourselves caught up in the love and the community and the grace of God. And that is just such a wonderful, mind-blowing 
thought. We find ourselves, if you like, in this eternal dance of the persons of the Trinity. Now, the persons of the Trinity all glorify each other. Jesus tells us this in John chapter 16 and John chapter 17. They all point to each other. They serve each other. There's no self-centeredness at all. Just complete, total, beautiful love. And this is why God is so beautiful. You know, we don't worship God because he is useful. That would be selfish. We don't worship God to get stuff from him. We worship God simply because he is beautiful. So let me just ask you some questions. Do you believe in God just because you think he's useful? Because you can get something out of him in order to look good or impress somebody or tick the box of going to church? Or do you worship him simply for who he is? Beautiful love, relationships, eternal glory. Also on the back of this, If we're called to reflect the life of God, how do we reflect this beauty of the relationships of the persons of the Trinity and our relationship with others? So, for example, if you're married, is your marriage to you about getting what you want out of that relationship? Or is it about centering yourself on the other and serving your spouse? What about your friendships? Are they about getting what you want out of them or are they about serving your friends? What about your relationship with your parents? or your kids. You know, the beauty of the Trinity has profound implications for the way in which we live. The truth about the Trinity is beautiful. Thirdly, the beauty of the Trinity is truly life-changing. Now, Jesus is talking about baptism here in Matthew 28. Go into all nations, make disciples, by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have taught you. Now, thinking about baptism, the model for our baptism is, of course, Jesus's baptism. And at Jesus's baptism, we see all three persons of the Trinity. We see the Father speaking his affirmation over the Son, who is being clothed with power from on high by the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove. Now, the gospel writers, when they record Jesus' baptism, are very clearly wanting us to think about another time in the scriptures where the Father, the Son and the Spirit are present and where the Spirit is hovering over waters like a dove. What does it make us think of? Well, what the gospel writers want us to think about is creation. Here are the first few verses from the Bible. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now here in these first few verses of the Bible, we see the Trinity involved in the creation of the world. We see God speaking, God's word speaking and things coming into being. Jesus' name, one of his names, is the Word of God. Paul tells us in Colossians that he created all things. We also see the Spirit hovering over the waters, God creating. All three persons of the Trinity are present in the first few verses of Scripture. Now, the Gospel writers want us to think about this when they talk about Jesus' baptism, because Jesus' baptism was about new creation. You know, Jesus was going under the waters as a picture of him drinking um, of the waters of judgment. It was a picture of the cross. It was a picture of Jesus becoming sin so that we could be made new. Baptism in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit is about new creation. Now, as we start the journey of discipleship, which of course baptism is a glorious picture of, we remember That because of Jesus' death and resurrection, because the Father has chosen us, because the Spirit has revealed all of that to us and is applying that truth to our lives, we remember that we have been made new. Yes, we were made in the image of a triune God. Genesis 1 and 2 tells us that. But now we've been saved by the triune God and we even get to participate in his life. This is why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, 
If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Baptism in the name of the one true God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit points to the reality, pictures to us the reality that we have been made new. Baptism in this name of God enables us to participate in the driving force of love that is at the centre of the universe. We get to participate in the life of God himself. The beauty of the Trinity truly is life-changing. So the Trinity is truth. In fact, it's the most fundamental truth in the whole of the universe. That truth is truly, stunningly beautiful. And the beauty of that truth truly is life-changing. Amen. So how do we respond to these three things? That the Trinity is the most fundamental truth in the universe, that that truth is beautiful, and that the beauty of that changes us. Well, firstly, have a think this week about how you see the Trinity and what we believe about the Trinity changing the way that you think about the world. If you want to do some further reading, I'd really recommend you download or buy Tim Keller's book, King's Cross. There's some fantastic stuff in there on the Trinity, particularly in the opening chapters about the eternal dance of the persons of the Trinity. Secondly, we've, we've been thinking about how the persons of the Trinity always glorify and point to the other two. You know, the Father pointing to the Son who is promising that he's going to send the Spirit, who's going to point to Jesus, who says that he's going to glorify the Father, who says he's going to glorify the Son. They're always pointing to the other. Now, this should affect the way that we live our lives as Christians. So if you are married, I really do encourage you to think about if your marriage reflects this. Are you living to get what you want out of it or um, are you serving your spouse? Think about that for your friendships and for your, your relationships in your family. How are you reflecting the truth of the Trinity, the beautiful truth of the Trinity in the relationships in your life? We also looked, didn't we, at how the Trinity is life changing. If you've been listening to this and you thought, oh, my gosh, love starts to make sense. If God is there is a God who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, maybe maybe this God is the most central truth in the universe. If you'd like to know more, we would love to hear from you. You can get in touch with us by going to stthomas.church forward slash hello. But we would also love to invite you to start following Jesus today. You can be in relationship with this one true God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit right now. If that's for you, let's pray together now. Father, thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be my saviour. I say sorry for all the wrong in my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit now and give me a fresh start for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, please get in touch. We would love to hear from you. Olivia and John are going to lead us in prayers. Father, thank you that you are slow to anger and rich in love. Thank you that you fill us with your heart for your people. So that when we love people, it's because you loved them first. I pray that we would just know the significance and the reality of the fact that you sent your son to die to save us. We just know that deeper and deeper in our hearts. And that, that would spur us on to share it with the world. Father, help us share your good news with the world so that they may know who you are. Jesus, thank you that you came to save us, that you died for us and that you rose again and that everything you said is true. Thank you that you are the servant king. Help us be more servant hearted, Lord. Help us be more like you. Help us serve our friends that they may see who you are and turn to you and be saved. May, may the people around us, may our friends and our family and our communities who don't know you, May they see you in us. 
And may the glory all go to you, Lord. May we not hold on to any of it ourselves. Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for saving us. And thank you that you are the servant king. Holy Spirit, thank you that you fill us and you choose to make us your dwelling place. Please fill us now and give us give us the motivation and the strength to share your love with the world. Thank you, Father. May we always point people to you. Amen. The Collect for today, Trinity Sunday. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us, your servants, grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith that we may evermore be defended from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to sing our final song.
believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion And in your holy church I believe in the resurrection When Jesus comes again For I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit Our God is free in one I believe in the resurrection Just a couple of church notices from me. Next Wednesday, we're having an Instagram live interview with Paul Harcourt, who is the national leader of New Wine and local church leader at All Saints Woodford Wells. And Paul is going to be exploring with us how we read the Bible. And there'll be a real opportunity for us to interact with Paul as Ben interviews him. And uh, we'll be able to ask him some questions. So do tune in next Wednesday night, 7.30, on our Instagram account from St Thomas's. Now, also with uh, New Wine, this year, obviously, we are unable to meet for the United Summer Gathering in Peterborough, but we are still meeting, and we're meeting for United Breaks Out in our own home. So for five days this summer, from the 30th of July to the 2nd of August, there's going to be a whole program for children, for young people and, of course, adults, which we here at St Thomas's are going to get behind and engage with. And that means for that Sunday in August, all of our worship and teaching uh, will join together with the new wine family. So watch this space for more details. Uh, we're so excited for what's in store. May the Lord bless us and keep us. Amen. See you at coffee.